Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, Jen is here to brief on the financial side, right? Thomas Kuljan cannot join us. He is uh, doing a little trip up to the main campus. If you need the forms, Milt will pass them around. Also at the end of the table uh, is the schedule for the upcoming Vibe events. So without further ado, Jen. All right, so yeah, there's actually two different um, forms. I kind of did up some mock financial statements that we can go over. And then um, just a little bit about myself. My name is Jen Unra, and I am um, a CPA. I have my own private practice in Tacoma. I actually started out with a local firm, a little bit larger firm. Um, I worked there for about six and a half years. And then once I started a family, kind of decided that being a CPA, working tax season hours and all that stuff was just not conducive to raising a family. So I um, started my own practice, was very part-time for a while while my kids were young and you know just worked like 20 25 hours a week and then eventually kind of grew my practice I ba basically became full-time I now have two associates that both work for me part-time um, we're a little bit unique in that we all work from our own home so we don't have an office at all um, we spend a lot of our time at our clients I really believe in in the hands-on when you're working with clients and working with financial statements um, Financial statements are as diverse as the clients that you work with. You know, I work with all types of business. I kind of specialize in the nonprofit industry, um, but also have professional um, manufacturing service. And, um, you know, no two clients are the same, and no two financial statements literally are the same. I mean, I do. Um, basically custom financial statements for most of my clients I present to a lot of the financial statement boards for the nonprofits that I work with so um, there's a couple of ones that we can go over and then I'll kind of open it up to questions that you guys have and then I want to talk a little bit about um, not only the financial statements that you see on paper but kind of the controls and the good um, policies and procedures behind financial statements because I think that really that's the most important thing I mean anybody can put numbers on a piece of paper but um, the two most important things about your financial statements is that they have to be accurate and they have to be timely because if you're not getting good information, you can't run your business. I mean, I tell my clients all the time, it's your job to run your company or your organization. It's my job to provide you accurate financials so that you can make those good decisions because if you don't have the right numbers, you can't run your business. So um, that's kind of my passion. I love what I do. Um, again, I've been doing it for about 23 years and I hope I never stop. But um, so. One thing, if we look at the balance sheet first, which says ABC Company balance sheet, um, a balance sheet is really a, a financial statement that represents a point in time. So it's as of a specific date. Um, most small businesses will run um, accounting software like a QuickBooks or a Sage or some kind of a small business software which will automatically generate just a custom financial statement. That's kind of what this is. This is a QuickBooks statement. Um, and so it's a point in time. So if you run a financial statement today, you'll get the balances as of today. Um, assets, liabilities and equity are your main categories that you're grouping into with the financial statement. Um, you can again break down specific more specifically as specific as you really want to get um, assets represent the the hard assets of your company you have cash you have inventory if you're a if you sell a product um, if you have a service business you would probably not have inventory um, as you can see you have accounts receivable there's actually two ways to keep your books in the accounting world either a cash basis or an accrual basis so cash basis basically you don't have accounts receivable you don't have accounts payable what comes in is revenue at the time it comes in what goes out is expenses at the time it goes out with an accrual basis type of account um, you're accruing um, invoices as you send them. So when you bill a customer, you haven't received their money yet, but you're counting that as revenue when you've billed it to them. Same with your expenses. You get an invoice from a vendor and you record it as an expense and a payable even though you haven't paid it yet. And you know, there's reasons for both. There's, there's good reasons for being cash basis. There's also reasons for being accrual basis. Most service type industries tend to be more cash basis because they're, they're really just, when, they're, when their product is sold, um, their services are provided, they recognize that income. Most people that sell merchandise or manufacturers, retailers, wholesalers, are more accrual because they want to keep track of who owes them money and you know often they'll have receivables which are pretty much equal to like one month of sales because you're invoicing at the end of the month and then you hold those receivables don't get paid till the end of the next month so if you look at the assets you can see that there's cash there's money market there's um, accounts receivable there's inventory there's prepaid expenses um, often you have security deposits for um, 
people or for rent. Um, there's also fixed assets, and that's like your tangible personal property. So if you have um, equipment, your desks, your computers, um, Normally, if you have a building, you would have buildings, you could have leasehold improvements, you might have company vehicles, and then those things are depreciated over time. So that's what the accumulated depreciation is there for. Um, you capitalize those, and then you're required to depreciate those over their estimated useful life. So then that equals your total net assets, which is really the total value of your company at any given time. Um, then you have liabilities and equity. Your liabilities are things that you owe other people. So you have accounts payable, what you owe your vendors. You have payroll taxes, which is what you owe the government. You have sales taxes, which is what you owe the state. Um, and then you may or may not have debt. So like a line of credit is a current asset because it's a revolving line that you could pay down at any point in time. And then you have long-term liabilities like bank loans or vehicle loans, um, other debt that you've incurred to either buy equipment or to just fund the activities of your business. So then your total liabilities, and then the difference really between your total liabilities and your um, assets is your equity. And so that's the value of what your, the net of what your company is worth. So assuming that you took all your assets and you liquidated them, you converted them into cash, you paid down all your liabilities, that's what you would have left. That's the equity in your business. And so again, um, this represents a corporation. So a corporation would have corporate capital stock. Um, and then if you have owners of a corporation, they are often taking distributions. So I just kind of showed that on there. Retained earnings is the cumulative of profits that you haven't spent in prior years. So money that's come in um, and has gone out and then you haven't actually spent that. So that's held in retained earnings. And then net income is really the income that you've made in the current year. And again, this is a kind of a QuickBooks pro forma. So that's how they present it as, as your net is just what you've earned in the current year. So then your total equity, again, the 319 there is the value of the net value of your company um, and again like I said if the most important thing is really for your financial statements to be accurate and it's very easy for corporations to manipulate financial statements and often do um, for various reasons say you want to go to the bank and get a loan so you want your net income to be higher you can overstate your inventory understating your cost of goods and you can show more profit than you really have in your company um, which is why accuracy is really important. And as a small business owner, it's really important for you to be involved in your financial statements. You may not be the one entering the transactions if you have a bookkeeper or an accountant, but you need to know that the numbers that you're being given when they generate a financial statement out of an accounting software are correct and are accurate. Um, and again, we'll kind of talk about controls and stuff later. Does anybody have questions on the balance sheet, just kind of the format of that and what it represents? I know we wanted to pass around the mic if anybody did have questions. You do? Okay. So how often would you want to go over this to make sure it's current? Like monthly? At least monthly. Yeah, at least monthly. So for like with all my clients, I always generate financial statements once. Um, I try to have financial statements for a client by the 15th of the following months. It takes a while to close the books. Once you get your bank statement and you reconcile everything, making sure that your cash is all adjusted, making sure your liabilities are all adjusted, all your invoices are posted, um, then you would want to print out financial statements and, um, and review them, make sure that everything is, is accurate. Yeah, so I would definitely recommend it a minimum monthly. I mean, you could run them, you know, if you're making a big business decision, you could run them in the middle of the month, but they might not be fully adjusted just because you may have some transactions that haven't posted or accruals haven't been adjusted for, for a month end. But most businesses will do adjustments every month and make sure that they have monthly financial statements that are accurate. Okay. And often if you do have loans, the bank will ask for monthly or quarterly financial statements. So, you know, they want to know that you're keeping your books up and doing your due diligence in, with your finances. And so say you know your income from your business is, say, for example, 100000 mm -hmm. How much would you know to pay, take out for taxes? So. That's a good question. So it kind of depends on, on how your business is structured. A corporation pays taxes at a corporate level, which is a different rate than a personal level. Um, if you're an S-corp or a partnership, then that tax flows through to your personal income tax return. And in that case, you'd kind of have to know what your personal income tax level. I would say probably if you're about 100000 in income, a safe percentage would be like 20 25%. Okay. Yeah. And you would say that and you, yeah, you would pay that in quarterly. The IRS does um, ask that if you're making, especially if you're a corporation, if you're making income that you make quarterly tax payments, they don't want you to owe it all at the end. 
You can, but they'll penalize you for it. Thank you. So yeah, <laughs> good question. Okay, so if there's no other questions on balance sheet, we can take a look at the next one. Um, this is a profit and loss statement or an income statement or a statement of revenue expense. Again, there's multiple names you can use. But basically, this is a, a document that shows your profit. And unlike a balance sheet that's at a point in time, this normally covers a period of time. So this one, for example, is for first quarter of January through March 2016. Um, I presented one that shows budget because I think budgeting is also very important in in um, running a business, having goals, having budgets, trying to look at actual compared to budget. Um, and again, financial statement, especially on an income statement side, can vary so much. I mean, I have a, one client that I literally prepare like eight financial statements every month for because they want to see one that looks like this compared to budget. They want to see one with every single month. Um, there's a, also like a trend report that shows a 12-month rolling average. So you're seeing the last 12 months regardless, not necessarily like the 12 months of the year. Um, you know, you can look at prior year compared to current year, which is often important, especially if you're just starting out a business and you've only been around for a couple years, you kind of want to see how am I doing this year compared to how I did at the same time period last year. So again, this one is just first quarter, shows budget. So you've got, at the top, you've got your income. Um, I just added a couple of different income levels. And you could tailor this to your own, um, your own financial statement needs. If you have like two or different types or segments of income, you can break that out specifically. This one just shows sales income, shipping income, interest income, and then a total income. And then cost of goods sold is really the cost of, um, the direct cost of what you produce or what your service is. So we have here cost of goods sold materials, labor, subcontractors. Um, you can have a whole lot of other things in cost of goods sold. I have clients that have shipping and cost of goods sold, that have their vehicle expenses and cost of goods sold, de really depends on what your business is. So your cost of goods sold, um, your gross income minus your cost of goods sold is your gross profit. And one thing you do want to pay attention to is your margins, which is the percentage your gross profit is um, to your total income. I mean, if when you're pricing, especially if you're selling a product, if you're pricing a product, you kind of need to know what your overhead is and what your product costs to know, you know, what do I price this product at so that I can actually make a profit at the end of the day. And then you have your general operating expenses, which um, this is just kind of a laundry list of them, auto expenses, computer expenses, contributions, depreciation, dues. Um, employee related costs are often a big percentage of costs. So you have employee benefits, you have meals and entertainment, you have p different payroll expenses, um, your insurance expense, and then your rent, your utilities, shop expenses, phone, things like that are all just part of your costs. And again, this is totally tailored to your own business needs. If you know, you could have 50 accounts or you could only have 10 accounts. The IRS really doesn't care how many expense accounts you use. I mean, they kind of have their pre-described format, but for your business, it's important to know what your costs are at a detailed level that, you know, helps you run your business better. And then your net income is really your bottom line. So that's after you've paid everything off. Um, this is what you're making. This is your actual profit in the business. And, and like, um, was asked that is what you would pay tax on or that's what would flow through to your own personal return and then you would pay tax at an individual level on that amount of income. Any questions on financial statement? Yeah. Cost of labor versus uh, payroll. What, is, what goes into a cost of labor? Um, really, it's, I have several clients who um, they differentiate their labor costs for producing a product from their labor costs that are overhead. So they would have payroll costs in both spots. So cost of labor, if you're producing, manufacturing something, then the people who are on the manufacturing line, their labor would go into the cost of goods labor. Your office staff, your sales staff, um, the people that sell the product, their labor would go into an overhead. So you would have labor, it's a total labor cost, um, you know, when you run payroll, but it's just differentiated on the profit and loss as two different types of labor costs. Got it. Any other questions? You mentioned about paying quarterly or anticipated yes. quarterly tax. What's the penalty if you undershoot that? Um, it varies. It depends by how much you undershoot it. I think roughly it's, it's between like 5 and 10%. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, banks love to look at the cash flow of yes. the company and get beyond just the income statement, the balance yes. sheet. 
So what are your recommendations with respect to that run a cash flow statement every three months or something? Yeah, and cash flow, I mean, and that's another another statement that can really vary. Um, if you actually do an audit, their cash flow statement is going to differentiate cash into kind of the uses of cash, cash for operating, cash for investing, cash for financing. Um, I think QuickBooks runs more of a, like, a cash flow that kind of shows you what the ends, what came in as cash, what came out as cash, so you can use that for projection. But you definitely can run a cash flow statement that starts with your, um, one thing is a lot of your expenses won't necessarily be cash expenses like depreciation. So it's going to start with your, your net income and then it's going to add back certain things. And I know that's what banks do. They add back depreciation. They add back officer salary because they want to see, you know, what's this business really generating from a cash perspective because they want to know if you have the ability to pay back your loan. So, um, yeah, so cash flow statement is another one that I, I know businesses don't necessarily look at those on a month to month basis, but it is a good um, tool to have to run your cash flow statement and to look at what cash has come in for the month or the quarter, what cash has gone out, which, which expenses um, don't actually involve cash, um, and then which ones do. Yeah. When creating a budget, um, you have uh, you worked out what you think you're going to spend on a particular category for mm -hmm. the year, but you have a seasonal business. Yes. Would you say that it's a good idea to um, s split that, that total number up over the year equally or try to account for your seasonality and make those changes? That really depends on your business. Um, again, I have clients that do both. I have clients that budget, and one way to budget is like if you use an, annual, an annualized budget, then you're breaking it up over the course of the year and you're looking at, you know, either evenly or breaking up. If you know that your business is seasonal, like you know you're, you're generating a lot of profits in first quarter, I would recommend breaking that up annually, not evenly, not throughout, you know, not just dividing by 12. Um, another way that I really like to look at budgets is tracking at where you're at compared to total budget. So if your total budget is a million dollars and it's in first quarter, you know, are you at 250 for revenue or are you under or over that? Um, I actually, I should have brought a couple with me. I actually do a lot of graphing for some, for my clients and we kind of look at budgets compared to total budget because you know, you got the red line that's this is your goal and then you've got the blue line that tracks up to your goal. Um, another, another thing about budgeting is I really do like to look at budget compared to current year and prior year because then that really does show you um, how you're trending within the year. I mean, if you're seasonal, then it's not necessarily going to be a third of the budget or a quarter of the budget, but you can get an idea of where were you at this time last year for the first three or four months of the year. And that'll help you determine more if you're kind of behind for the year or ahead for the year, more than just tracking with the budget. So really doing both, kind of looking at the budget and kind of looking at where you were at prior years. Any other questions? How we're doing on time. Okay, so um, another thing that I wanted to talk about just in relation to, you know, having good financial statements is really the idea of good accounting controls. I mean, like I said, a lot of, um, a lot of businesses, small and large, are going to have other people doing their accounting, you know, on the back end. You're going to have somebody else entering your invoices and processing your payroll. And, um, and it's really important for you as a small business owner to know that those numbers that they're putting in there are accurate and to be looking at things. Um, a good th a good cash control, um, in my opinion, is to be the one that signs the checks. When you're a, first, a small business, when you're first starting out, you should be looking at everything that goes out the door. Every, any kind of purchase, you know, um, credit card transactions, cash transactions. As the small business owner, it's important that you know what what is being paid. Um, as you get bigger, and you know, you may have a controller who signs the checks, I th still think it's important to get like a, a weekly um, cash disbursements journal report so that you can see what's going out, what, what you're paying. Same thing with income. I mean, looking at what's coming in, getting reports um, other than just a, a financial report, but getting reports that show, you know, what came in this week, what was cash receipts, what did that look like? And that kind of goes back to being able to analyze your cash flow. If you kind of know what should be coming in on a weekly and monthly and quarterly basis, then you'll know if you're tracking, you know, with where you should be and then what's going out, what kind of expenses are you paying. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for people and companies to commit fraud, unfortunately. And I've been involved with several clients normally after fraud has happened and they're calling going, you know, this happened, what did we do wrong? What could we do differently? Um, the number one thing that will prevent people from committing fraud in your company is knowing that somebody else is looking at their work. 
I mean, if you know that somebody else is going to be opening that bank statement and looking at every check you write, you're going to be much less likely to try to steal from the company till. So it's very important that as a small business owner, you stay involved in the finances of your company. And then there's other assets besides cash. Um, I've had clients that have had employees, you know, steal property, steal equipment, you know, stuff can easily walk out the door. So just, you know, being aware of, of what, what assets you have, what inventory you have. Um, if you do, if you are a very strong inventory based um, organization, then also the inventory control procedures when inventory is counted at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter or however often you count, being personally involved in that. I mean, I have clients that um, have fairly large companies and they're still involved in counting inventory inventory they still pull sheets and do spot checks and you know make sure that inventory is being counted and priced correctly um, so that they know that the financial statements that they have are accurate um, so it's really important to protect your assets and and not just cash um, if you once you are growing it's really important to have segregation of duties if you have um, multiple people in your accounting office you know having one person process payroll having a different person process accounts receivable having a different person process accounts payable it's just really important to um, have that segregation and have people cross trained so that you know when people are on vacation somebody else can do their job you don't want one person you know the only person who can do this and nobody else knows how to do it and they're sick for a week and, and and you're kind of out of luck. So having having good controls, having good cross training, um, and using a good accounting system. And like I said, there's lots of canned accounting systems out there. I think um, both Sage and QuickBooks are good accounting systems, but they do have the limitations of not having really great controls. Um, if you're a specialized industry, you can have a, a specialized accounting system. I have several legal firm accounting um, clients that they have you know, a, a legal accounting system that offers time and billing and all that kind of stuff that they need and, and more meets their needs. Um, manufacturing, there's a lot of different manufacturing accounting softwares out there, but you know, it takes some, some research and try to, to make sure you figure out that you're using an accounting software that's gonna do what your business needs it to do on the backside. Um, and then really just being involved in, in the business and protecting your assets. Um, it's just really, really important to make sure that you have good financial information to make business decisions. Challenge, um, yeah. Uh, smaller companies have a real, it's a real challenge for have adequate internal control. Yes. What, are you, what kind of recommendations do you, have you made along the way? And most of that I think is owner involvement um, and also having an outside person. I mean, that's what I do for a lot of my clients. I kind of joke that I'm like the offsite CFO because for a lot of my clients, that is what my staff and I do. I mean, they do all the day to day, they do the payroll, they do the AR and AP. And then we come in at the end of the month and spend anywhere from only two to maybe eight hours and reconcile everything, make sure everything's tied out. Um, we go through the bank statements and go through the loan statements and you know go through accounts receivable and accounts payable and make sure that everything um, everything ties out. I mean, I know last week the, the gentlemen that were here really stressed the importance of, in a business, having strong partnerships with other people, you know, with your accountant, with your attorney, with your payroll specialist, with the people that do your insurance. And, and I think that's really important. I mean, having a good accountant and, and is really important. And otherwise, I'd just say, as an owner, staying really involved. Any other questions? These are all good annual or point in time type mm -hmm. things. Uh, I'm more interested in if I'm looking at a business or, or a building. Okay. Uh, you know, how do I tell where my break point is? Okay. Uh, you know, where do I start? Where can I expect to make a pro profit? Okay. Because there's going to be a lot of front loaded cost. Yes. You know, as a new business, you're probably not going to be profitable right away and I want to know how long or how much over time I need to invest. So how would, how would you set that up? And so that's mostly like budgeting or forecasting. So trying to get an idea, which is, is more difficult obviously than producing financial statements on an existing business, but you'd really have to get an idea of what your costs are up front. Um, and trying to figure out what your financing is for those costs. I mean, I know when you're going into a new business kind of venture, um, figuring out what your, your monthly utilities and rent and things like that are gonna be, and then also figuring out what the costs of um, acquiring those certain types of like new business ventures are. Um, I would say, you know, as much as you can be specific on what you think your costs are gonna be. It's, 
um, really important, I think, when you're buying a new business or buying a business from somebody else to, to get their financial statements and try to find out what their costs along the way are. Um, I've had a couple of clients like acquire other businesses and you know you can do it very fairly smoothly just because you know you can look at what they're doing and, and not have to have a lot of time where you're spending you know extra time or extra money um, investing in stuff because you can kind of pick up with using their suppliers and using their vendors. Does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay. I'll let it perform. Yeah, I mean the budget. I think budgeting is very important because you do get an idea of you know what where um, where you want to be in a business, especially when you're just starting out in a new business. I mean, it's really hard to do a budget for a new business because you don't really know what your sales are going to be or how much things are going to cost. I think it's actually easier to do the costs first and then try to back into this is what my revenue needs to be to break even or to cover my costs. There's fixed costs like your rent, your utilities, um, and then there's variable costs. I mean, there's if you have a especially like a service type business, your payroll is going to fluctuate depending on um, how much business you generate. So knowing what those costs are and what the break even point is, you know, if we service this many customers, this is what payroll is going to be, this is what our fixed costs are going to be, this is what our profits going to be. Because I actually just recently was working with a client that um, they're growing really, really fast and they got to the end of the year and they're actually, their bottom line actually went down from the prior year. And they were like, well, you know, we're, we're doing way more business. And I said, yeah, but it's costing you so much more to generate that extra business that, you know, like you said, for this year, I think in the future years, I think they're going to see a huge profit. But in the initial year of investing that time, and especially if you have to acquire a lot of property, plant, and equipment kind of costs, those costs can be really expensive. I mean, they had to go back to their bank and ask for more funding and increasing their line of credit. So you kind of have to make sure that, especially if you're in a growing phase of your business, that you're not growing faster than you can afford. Because, you know, yeah, it's great that they have more business, but it costs them more to generate that business or to get that business than they really anticipated. Um, and I know they were actually working with another CPA prior and, and they did some forecasting and, and they were just off. I mean, I think they did their due diligence trying to figure out where they should be, but it just cost them more than they anticipated. So it is really important, especially when you're, you're entering a new venture to know those capital costs because your asset costs, um, you know, can be really big if you have to buy a lot of equipment or, or property. I have a two-part question. Yeah. First of all, uh, if you're having a, if you're starting a nonprofit, mm -hmm. do you think it's best to have a CPA from the very beginning? Yes. And the second thing is, what's the average rate of hiring a CPA for a year? It really varies. I mean, you can have a CPA provide all different services. I mean, if you know, everybody has to have their tax returns done, so that's a that's a pretty standard cost. Um, and then otherwise, it just really depends on how much time. Like I said, I have clients that I only spend like two or three hours a month on, um, which obviously is a minimal cost. And I have clients that I'm there 20 hours a month because I'm more doing the day to helping them more with the day to day and the analyst and stuff like that but so it really does vary and I think you really want to shop CPA firms I mean you really want to make sure that their philosophy is in line with your philosophy and most of the bigger CPA firms are really kind of the one-stop shopping I am not I mean I really only do accounting service and consulting but I have the CPA firm that I used to work for they do all the tax work and all the audit and compliance work for all my clients so we have a really great partnership I mean I'm very fortunate that I you know maintained a good relationship with them but you can normally get like your day-to-day -day, your basic accounting like I'll be honest my rate is cheaper than their staff rate and I've been in business for 23 years but I don't have any overhead so I mean I can keep a low rate and and I love doing what I do so you know I I try not to be very expensive so you know if you're using somebody that's like a bookkeeping or an accounting service it doesn't even necessarily have to be a CPA there are several firms in Tacoma that um, there's one called By the Numbers that's up on Fawcett that they're just like a bookkeeping service. It's always cheaper for the basic bookkeeping to be to have somebody in house than to have somebody outside. I mean, because you're going to pay that premium for having an accounting firm do that over just hiring, you know, a bookkeeper. But um, so it, it's really going to vary. But I would say you're probably looking at for the tax return and getting started and stuff like that a couple thousand dollars and then maybe an ongoing of a thousand or so a month if they're very involved you know less if they're not that involved but it just really depends but definitely when you're starting a business you know you want to have a lawyer you want to have a CPA you want to have a good insurance person because they can really help guide you and you know a lot of times people think 
um, oh, it's too expensive to hire a CPA. But I'm telling you, if you don't hire a CPA and then you have mistakes and problems and messy financials, because honestly, that's what I love is the whole cleanup and the forensic accounting and getting in there when somebody's books are a mess. But that's not good for them because they had to go through the whole turmoil of getting to the place where they couldn't read their financial statements. I mean, when you go out to a client and they say, nobody's reconciled a bank statement in six months, I just cringe because you know it's a mess. But, um, you know, so if you have somebody from the beginning, you're going to save money because if you have to hire somebody to come in and do cleanup, I mean, I could spend 30 hours a week doing cleanup for you, where I could spend two hours a week doing basic service and giving you good financial statements every month. Um, yeah. For you about um, budgets. Yeah. Um, an argument against budgets is that um, you know, you're pre planning your spending, and mm -hmm. it turns out that you don't need to spend those dollars, you'll find a way to spend those dollars or move it around to somewhere else or something like that. What have you seen in the different companies you work for when it comes to um, staying disciplined when it comes yeah. to and I, I think that really depends on the individual. Um, I think budgets are a really good tool, but I don't, I don't, you know, make or break on a budget because I, I think you're exactly right. You, you could way exceed your budget under or over, and I don't really think that's a big deal. I know when I, I had one client that I started working for, and they would kind of change their budget as their, as certain things changed, and people do that. It's called a static budget, and your budget changes, and and kind of, you know, if you know you're going to get more business, you increase your budget and you increase your line items and stuff. But you know, they were really worried when they didn't make budget or when they weren't on budget or when they were over budget. And I'm like, you know, your budget is just a guideline. And if there's a reason to go over budget, then go over budget. If going over budget by $1,000 means you're going to make $5,000, go over budget. But you do have to be disciplined if you see a line item. And more with, I think, with the staff than the owners. I mean, if your staff knows that they have $5,000 in office expenses, they may just go buy fancy office supplies because they have $5,000 in office expenses. So I think it has to really start at the top. That um, The other thing that I really like to do in budgeting is um, incentivized based on budget. I have one company that I work with that does this really well. Their whole bonus pool is tied to their budget. And when their company makes budget, they all get a 1% bonus every quarter. So, you know, it's a really good tool. It's a really good incentive for their staff to stay under budget, to really monitor their costs, and to really sell because it's really based on their revenue. I mean, revenue is really where you make or break your budget. I mean, your expenses can be up or down, but if you don't make your revenue budget, that's where you're really in big trouble. So um, they, you know, like I said, they they do an incentive bonus based on budget, and I find that that really works well. Um, and it doesn't even have to be like a salary thing. You could just do, you know, if we make budget every month, um, we do an office party, or we we do everybody gets to go home at noon on a Friday at the end of the month or something. But um, And I do think it's really important if you have a big enough organization that you have managers and you have people that can influence your budget, that they're involved in the budgeting process, that they're involved in helping create the budgets and they're involved in helping stay on budget because that's really important. It's not just the owner's responsibility for the budget. It's really you know everybody in the organization's responsibility to make sure that budgets are, are adhered to and are maintained. Any other questions about financials, budgeting? We're all knowledgeable now. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> That's a really good summary. Good. Thank you. I know. I think we're a little early. Oh, we're a lot early. Yeah, when Tom asked me to speak, I'm like, I don't know if I can, I can talk for an hour about financial statements. But I mean, I have lots of business advice. I, I'm happy to answer any questions related to businesses, running your business. Yeah, well, come back here. Yeah. Um, for a sole proprietor kind of business, mm -hmm. what do you kind of advise? They're still trying to figure out how, how they're going to be profitable. Okay. And when they're creating the books, creating a salary for that sole proprietor. For that individual? Right. What do you know of any advice for that? Well, okay, for so one thing, a sole proprietor actually doesn't take a salary. So if you're uh, yeah. Okay. S corporation. Okay, so if you're an S corporation, um, and and again that really depends on the organization. 
I like to structure my S corporations where the salary is kind of kept at a minimum and then the rest of it is taken out in draws just because there's a better tax advantage to that. I mean, say you're an organization that's going to make $100,000 net at the end of the year and you're an S corp. Um, you have to take a reasonable salary, which the IRS doesn't define with any specific dollar amount. and. Um, and then you basically that's what you're paying your payroll taxes on. So if you're making about $100,000 a year, if you take a $50,000 salary, then you're paying payroll taxes on that $50,000. You can take the other $50,000 out in draws as an S corp, and then you save 15% payroll tax on that. So I like to structure the S corps that I work with where they're keeping their salary at a fairly minimal level, um, and then they're taking out the rest of their um, pro of their profits really in draws. And the IRS, um, the last time the IRS <coughs> audited for reasonable salary and it went to court, reasonable salary was deemed at $80,000. So I have a couple of clients who um, they're making, each individual owner is making well over 300000 a year and we're taking like 80 or 90 salary and then everything else comes out in draws. Which, I mean, if you figure 15% on an additional um, hundred plus thousand dollars a year, that's a pretty big tax savings. That's, a, you know, an additional 15, 20,000 a year that they get to have in their pockets instead of paying payroll taxes on. Can you, can you go through the differences? Because I think, you know, yeah. looking at a, a consultant firm, yes. uh, you know, between a sole proprietorship, just getting a business license mm -hmm. versus an S Corp right. or an LLC and the advantages and disadvantages yeah. of those. I think it's probably, a lot of us are starting small. Yeah. And so, you know, what's, yeah. what's the way to go there? So normally when you start small, it is best to start as a sole proprietorship. I mean, if your income is going to be less than about that $100,000 for the first few years, it's very easy to just be a sole proprietorship. I mean, you have to get a, a license with the Department of Revenue, but you don't have to actually do anything with the IRS. You don't have to, you don't have to become a corporation. You don't have to file articles of incorporation. You do B&O. Yeah, B&O. So that's the Department of Revenue. Yeah. So you have to, you have to file with the state, but you don't actually have to file to become a corporation. So um, for the first couple years, if you're going to be small, it's better to be an S Corp. You do pay tax then on 100% of the earnings that you make. So if your net at the end of the year is 50000 that's what you're paying tax on is, is the earnings that you make. But you're not filing an extra tax return. You're not having to get a corporation. You're not having to do all the legalese, um, you know, related to a corporation. And it's just, if it, especially if it's just you, you know, the one-man show kind of thing. Then if you want to become um, an LLC or an S corporation, that's where you have to go that extra step and you have to get articles of incorporation you have to file with the um, with the IRS and request a separate tax ID number um, you have to you know be basically become a separate entity then you're filing at the end of the year your individual return and also either an S Corp return or a partnership return now if you're an LLC you can elect to be filed as either so a limited liability corporation can either elect to be filed as a partnership or can be filed as an S corporation. And there's advantages and reasons that you do both. Um, I prefer S corps personally, just because of the whole tax limitation. If you are an LLC and file as a partnership, then 100% of your earnings are taxed as um, self-employed. So that's where, you know, that 100,000, your whole $100,000 that you made at the end of the year would be taxed payroll taxes, you know, federal taxes, 100% taxed. If you're an S Corp, you can define your salary at that 50,000 range and have 50,000 of that be taxed for payroll and the other 50 only be taxed at your federal tax rate. Um, there's reasons that you can't be an S Corp. Certain types of organizations can't be an S Corp. One thing you can't be an S Corp, if you have partners and you don't equally share profits according to your partnership agreement, then you can't be an S Corp. So for example, I'm partners, we're partners and we're 50-50. And we can take different salaries, but at the end of the day, our K-1s that differentiate our partner income have to be 50-50 of the business. If you specially allocate income, and this is um, quite often with professional service companies like I have several doctor's offices that do this so they specially allocate they keep track and in their internal system of how much each partner makes you know how much their billings are they allocate their expenses with this um, really complicated formula and then that is what goes on their k-1 so if I'm a doctor and I work full-time and I produce you know heavily I could have a hundred thousand dollars on my k-1 and my partner who's my 50 50 partner in the 
in the actual LLC could maybe work part time and not make as much money because you know they have a family and they don't want to, and then they only have fifty thousand on their K one. They can't be an S corp because you can't do that. You, if you're a fifty fifty partner, you'd have to take that hundred plus that fifty and each get seventy five. But one's taking a hundred, one's taking fifty of the net, and so they have to be a partnership. Does that make sense? It's, it's just kind of the IRS, the way they've structured it. So um, if you're an individual, you can be an S-Corp or an LLC. If you're an LLC as an individual, again, you pay tax on 100% of what you make for Social Security, Medicare, all payroll taxes, and then your own federal tax. Um, if you're in a partnership, you're, you're divided um, however you guys choose to split the profits, however many partners, you can have multiple partners. Um, you can still be a 50-50 partnership, but you can choose to specially allocate income and expenses. If you're an S-Corp, you have to have your percentage that you own in the company be the percentage of income you get on your K-1 at the end of the day. So hopefully that helps. And again, if when you're small, like I have several clients that I've had for a couple years, and they're still small, they're still growing their businesses, so we just have left them as S-Corps. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, as sole proprietorships. Um, I have a couple that I've just converted to S-Corps in the last year, and again, they just have to go through the process of electing um, to be an S-Corp and of filing the proper documents with the IRS and with the state to actually be a corporation in the state of Washington, and then they'll start. You have to, um, you have to. You, it's best to elect that by the first of the year, you have to elect it by March 15th of the year. So if you're going to be an S-Corp in 2016, it's too late, but if you wanted to be an S-Corp in 2017, you could elect to do that with the IRS by March 15th of 2018, and then you would be a partner, or of 2017, then you'd be um, an S-Corp for the whole entire year. So yeah. is there a guideline on what you consider small for those categories? Um, again, I kind of use about the $100,000 or under net. I mean, if you're if you're about a hundred thousand or or under net, then then you could stay at sole proprietorship until you've grown that um, past that amount. And again, that's just kind of based on the IRS's rule of a reasonable salary at about eighty to ninety thousand. Um, you certainly could do it sooner. I mean, and especially if you have partners. If you have partners, there's reasons to um, you know be one entity or the other for liability issues too. And even if you're on your own, I mean, the one thing about being a sole proprietor is that it is you, and it's just you are identified as the sole proprietor. And so, if for some reason you were to be sued or there was to be some kind of a liability issue you don't have that extra level of protection because they can come after you, your assets, your house. You know That's where when you become a corporation, then that stops at the corporate assets. Then really, um, you know, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but the, um, the corporate corporation protects you personally from certain kinds of things. I mean, and not, again, not always because you as an individual, if you commit a crime, they can still come after your personal assets even if you're a corporation. But, you know, there's legalese involved there. Yeah. This is uh, relatively specific, but you've worked for uh, a lot of different clients, and most of them have uh, marketing and advertising uh, budgets or, or dollars. Yes. Spending. Can you give me a range that you've seen of kind of what's typical for what people are willing to spend on marketing, advertising, you know, or more revenue? Yeah, um, I would say the clients that I have spend very little on marketing and advertising, to be quite honest. Um, probably less than 10%. I mean, they just don't, again, I work for a lot of nonprofits and they spend almost nothing on marketing and advertising other than like promoting their own events and they normally try to get that covered with sponsorship. Um, I do have a couple of clients who spend more on marketing and advertising, but really a lot of it's not expensive kind of stuff. A lot of it's word of mouth. Um, you know, a lot of them are using social media more now. And I mean, I have one person that does a lot of ads and stuff with like Google and it's like 25 bucks a shot. I mean, it's really, really inexpensive. So I would say for my client base, they're not spending a lot on marketing and advertising. So I really don't know what the industry kind of standard is. I don't know, somebody else in the room might. Yeah. Just experience based basically. That's, yeah. I mean I do social media marketing. Okay. Really, it's just more of experience. The more experience you have, the more you can charge. Yeah. So that's really what it's all about. And I think it depends on the industry too. I mean, some industries really need that, you know, that marketing, you know, social media beyond social media, like advertising on TV and radio and stuff like that. But I don't have clients that really do that. Question from the Gallery. 
Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you covered the uh, cash flow statement a little bit. Would you kindly uh, go over that again and uh, elaborate on the elements of a cash flow analysis? Okay. How is that different from an income statement? Okay. And what do you see from a cash flow analysis you don't see in an income statement? Okay. So the main thing you sh that a cash flow analysis shows is it starts with your beginning cash at the beginning of the year. Say you're doing an annual one like you do in an audit. And then it's going to show um, the different categories under which you received cash or spent cash. So your cash from operations would include, you know, all of your receivables that came in minus all of your payables that went out. And so then it's going to show like the net of cash that you increased or decreased from operations. And then you're going to have cash from um, financing activities so if you got cash from a line of credit or if you paid down more on your line of credit in that year than then you received it's going to show your in and out from your um, financing activity and then it's going to show the same for your investing activity so it's going to show if you made investments or if you sold investments um, again I don't have a lot of clients that invest really heavily but so it kind of breaks it down into the three categories but really the basis of a cash flow statement is, is it shows um, what your cash was at the beginning of the year how you spent your cash or received your cash during the year and then what your cash is at the end of the year so that's a traditional cash flow statement. Now, if you're using cash flow more for forecasting, um, then I think you're looking more at, like we were talking about before, um, when your customers pay, how are they paying? What is their payment cycle? And I have clients that kind of look at more the cycle of their cash flow, how much cash flow, especially if they're seasonal businesses, like you were asking, how much, you know, do they, um, I have one client that they do their budget annually, they break it down separately because they really do get a lot more business in certain months of the year. So when we really look at cash Cash flow, we have an expectation that cash flow is going to increase in first quarter, but then it's going to decrease in second quarter. And so you're using it more as trying to forecast what your cash should be and if your cash is going up and, and, and helps you plan better because if you know there's periods where you're going to be a little bit cash poor, then you need to plan for that. Either you need to kind of have the owners not take out as much in draws the months before because you know you're going to need that cash to get you through the next couple months because you're, um, you're expenses that don't change your overhead have to continue to be paid even if you're not doing as much in product sales or services those few months so it, it kind of depends on what your cash flow needs are if it's really just a strict cash flow statement it's just going to be this is how you started this is what you spent this is where you ended but if it's more for forecasting you can kind of look at the flow of your cash when your cash comes in and when your cash goes out okay. any other questions background and I was trying to figure out a medical business to start that provides a need for the community and I came up with an idea and I and I went to a, a networking event that provides storefronts here in Tacoma okay. but but I'm not sure because it's a little bit risky and so I was wondering if you have any ideas or anybody on good medical startups that is important to the community that there's a need for it that it would probably be successful, that you would provide jobs for people. And, I mean, I have my own ideas, but it's just me. I better have input. Yeah, you know, um, I do have some clients who are in the medical field, but they've been in practice for a long time. So I don't know how successful, you know, a medical startup would be. I think that's where you need to do your homework to see what the need is in the community and especially what your beginning costs are, because that's a big one. If, you know, if you need to fund it with a lot of money up front, yeah. then you're going to have to figure out what those costs are and how long it's going to maybe take to recoup those costs. Because I'm not sure if you're talking about like selling medical example, or providing medical services. Yeah, for example, medical supply stores, okay. medical supplies, or, okay. because there's always a need for stuff like that. Yeah. So I guess my caution there would be you're competing with people who are buying medical supplies in big volume. So if your price points would have to be really, really good to provide medical supplies to a local office, because, you know, they can get those from big box medical suppliers at a discount because they're buying in bigger volume. And that's true of any kind of a startup business that's selling a product. Um, and again, a lot of my clients are service-based clients, but I do have some clients that they have, it, it is very hard to start up a business when you're selling a product because if you're a small business and you're competing with a big chain, you're gonna have a hard time with your price points because you have to be able to offer your product at as low of a price as 
a big box store or or a store that you know somewhere you can get it in bulk because they're buying in bulk and you're not going to be able to buy at that same kind of volume. So when you're doing a retail or a wholesale business, you do really have to be careful to make sure that you can get your product in at a low enough cost that you can still sell competitively and make a profit. So then would it be more profitable to have a, a business that's based on providing a service rather than a product? I think so, yes. Okay. Yes. So like um, what kind of services are people looking for? For medical? Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's why I'd say you'd probably have to be specialized in like the medical industry. Also specialized yeah. In yeah. Okay. Yeah. I used to own a company called Northwest Medical Instruction, and it basically was started because someone asked for my service, and I took on different medical offices. It really depends, and when you say medical, that's a broad yeah, yeah. term. Yeah. You have to decide what you're going to specialize in okay. and what you're willing to offer to them mm -hmm. um, and how you're going to work that format. I never, ever had to rent a storefront. Mm -hmm. I went into their offices and mm -hmm. managed them and offered them services. So I didn't have that back end mm -hmm. um, okay. expense. <laughs> so you really have to decide. You, you have to narrow it down to mm -hmm. what you want that to look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. I bet that uh, doing things like uh, teaching uh, CPR or um, uh, certifying people for those types of things, mm -hmm. babysitters, caregivers, you're giving them some, some skills, there's probably a need for that as more and more of our population is getting into a, uh, you know, higher ages, there's, you know, we need to help them uh, when they fall down or when they choke or, you know, things like that. And so I was doing how to do that. We're looking for people to teach us that. Do that. So that could be a medical service that isn't technically require a doctorate or a medical degree, but is is reachable for any of us who went out and got the training. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, and kind of along those lines, I know in-home care is a is another yeah, big growing meal, medical field. I have one organization that I work for; they're a nonprofit, and they um, they are huge in the in-home care field. They do a lot of in-home care, so providing caregivers to go into the homes of elderly people who can't take care of themselves anymore because you know they want to stay in their own homes. That's a um, a very much a growing field right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, unless you guys have any other questions. Um, I do have some cards if you, anybody wants to take them and give me a call. I'm happy to give you guys advice or help you with startup businesses. Well, thank you, Jen. You're uh, welcome. Let's see what Thomas left you oh, in the okay. goodie bag. The goodie bag. The goodie bag. You must have, you have to come The purple home. mug, yeah. I like. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Beer for All right. <laughs> thank you very much.